Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be the kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things 
for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Whether good or ill is visited upon Job's circumstances, he persisted in integrity. How often is our faithfulness contingent on our temporary earthly conditions? A reading from the book of Job. There once was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turn away from evil. He still persists in his integrity although you incited him, me, against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all the people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he's in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and set among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as a foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. The word of the Lord. Yeah. 
Jesus is God's great gift to creation, the most intimate given of God's marvelous work to his cherished humanity. A reading from the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophet. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is a reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustained all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name as he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone had testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them or models that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to him, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He was fitting that God from whom, through whom all things exist in bringing his children to glory should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctify and those who are sanctified all have one father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. The gospel of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's talk about divorce. Let's talk about divorce. Let's talk about divorce. Let's talk about divorce. All right. <laughs> I just wanted to start us off on a happy mood. <laughs> uh, actually, so uh, this isn't in my sermon, but um, there's this, a comedian named Aziz Ansari, and he does this little stand-up bit about um, how would you explain marriage? If you were proposing marriage to somebody and they had no idea what marriage was, how would you explain it to them? And so he says, so I walk up, I walk up to my girlfriend and I say, you know how we've been hanging out together and really getting along really well. I think we should do that until one of us dies. <laughs> oh, who's that? Or, or he says, yes. what's this? Oh, that's a ring. I need you to put this on your finger so everybody knows we have an arrangement. <laughs> and who's this guy dressed in black? That's a priest. He's gonna make you swear to God that you're not gonna back out of this. <laughs> And then finally she says, well, why are we doing this? And he says, tax purposes. <laughs> I, again, I'm just trying to like lighten the mood just a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke to you about marriage, about mutuality and connection in marriage and the importance of bringing our children to church. That was no mistake. I knew this reading was coming up. <laughs> I wanted to say something positive about marriage before we got here. Today we hear about that other thing that can happen in marriages, which is divorce. And all of us in one way or another has been touched by divorce. 
either we ourselves have experienced it, our parents or someone that we know has experienced it. We know someone who has gone through divorce. In his article, Mishnah and Mark 10, John Instone Brewer makes a case for the context of Jesus' debate with the Pharisees in this morning's gospel. I've spoken about the Mishnah before in a few sermons, but just in case we needed a refresher, I have someone coming to help me tell you. The Mishnah was a set of texts that were interpretations of the law of Moses that were written and compiled by the early rabbis sometime after Jesus died. Of course, the debates were happening during the lifetime of Jesus, but they were written down after the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. And the Mishnah was finally completed about 200 CE, so it's got this long 130 year span of being written and compiled and edited. And just for a little context, that's about the distance between us and the Civil War. But the debates about these questions, according to Instone Brewer, go back all the way to Jesus' time. And divorce, of course, was one of the hot topics of Jesus' age, just as it's one of the hot topics of our age. In Jesus' time, there was a hot debate between two main schools of rabbis. One was led by Rabbi Hillel, and one was led by Rabbi Shammai. And they argued about the legal grounds, according to the law of Moses, based on Deuteronomy 24.1. The debate centered around how to understand the words indecent things. How do you understand you can divorce your wife for indecent things? So there's this highly syntactical argument that they make that has to do whether you separate indecent from thing or not, but we don't need to go into all that. In its simplest form, the debate was, is it okay to divorce one's wife for any reason or only the specific causes of adultery, failure to provide food, shelter, or love? So is it, is it just about breaking a vow that you've made, a covenant that you made, or can you divorce for any reason? That was the debate. The school of Hillel said, you can divorce for any reason. The school of Shammai said only the specific things that are laid out in Exodus 21 are grounds for divorce. So Jesus take, when we boil it down, is that marriage is not something to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, nor should it be exited unadvisedly or lightly. He sides with Shammai. In the Hillites style of divorce for any cause, one could get divorced from their wife if she wasn't a good cook. <laughs> or any similar reason. And they had debates about that. Could you divorce your wife if she was a bad cook? And they said, yeah, why not? Any reason. In the Shamite conception of divorce, a breaking of a vow was the only legitimate reason to get divorced. The reason that Jesus states that it is adultery to remarry after a divorce for any cause, as the Hillelites believed in, is because he didn't consider such a divorce to actually have taken effect. And so he considered that person to still be married. Jesus isn't totally against divorce. Jesus is, as we discussed two weeks ago, all about healthy and mutual marriage. Now, there are many differences between what Jesus is talking about and our own modern conception of divorce, but there are also some similarities. And based on the Mishnaic debate about divorce and Jesus' stance in that context, I basically have three things that I want to talk to you today about divorce from a Christian perspective as we, um, as we talk about it in the 21st century. The first is that for most people, divorce is not as clean or easy as our culture makes it seem. Number two, divorce is death. And number three, Nevertheless, sometimes divorce is necessary. In the last 10 years, I've seen the statistic of divorce rates in our culture with my own two eyes. Maybe you have too. Sometimes it seems like half of my friends who are married have gotten divorced and half have not. Now that might be a slight exaggeration, but as the years continue to go by, and especially as COVID continues on and puts stress on marriages, 
it's becoming closer and closer to true in my circle of friends. Do you know how many of my friends who have gotten divorced talk to anybody before they decided to get divorced? Talk to anybody. Do you know how many of my friends, when they did talk to us, having already decided that their marriage was over, tried to convince us that it was the best option and that they could co-parent their children and that it was all gonna work out just fine. Now this may seem difficult to hear, but it is a truth that our culture just wants everyone to be perpetually happy and have a good justification when things get difficult rather than trying to help us fight for what's worth fighting for. Our culture will always take the easiest way out every time and it will encourage us to take the easy way out. There is no instant gratification in fighting to save a marriage. It, it's just not, it's not easy. It's hard to do and it requires outside help from friends. It help, requires outside help from families and it requires sometimes a therapist. You can't do it by yourself. And so many people who end up getting divorced try to do it by themselves because seeking such help can be embarrassing. You don't want people around you and your circle of friends to know you're struggling in your marriage. That's, that can be embarrassing. It's almost less embarrassing in our culture to get divorced than to admit that our marriages are not perfect and that we need constant support and help. And why should that be the case? Why should it be the case that it's less embarrassing to get divorced than to ask people for help? Why should we be embarrassed to admit that we need help, that our marriages aren't perfect? I found myself in this situation in times of struggle during my own marriage. Why is it so hard for me to reach out to people for, for help? When they sat at my wedding and said, and said that they would do everything in their power to support these persons in their marriage. They made that promise to me and to Melanie. The people who were at your wedding ceremonies made that promise to you. All of us, by being with you, are making that promise as well to support you in your marriage. Well, why is it so hard for me to ask for help? I have also internalized this cultural embarrassment of asking for help. Our culture tells us it will be easier and more accepted to simply throw up our hands and tell everyone we tried our best and just move on. Which brings me to my second point. Divorce is death. For all the rosy pictures about divorce that I have heard, for all the TV shows that glamorize the freedom of ending a marriage, I have seen very few divorces live up to the hype. I've seen heartache. I've seen promises about co-parenting, about respecting one another, about continuing to be a family, about having an amicable divorce. I've seen all of those broken. And I've wondered in my own head, and sometimes I've even said aloud to people when talking to friends who are uh, talking to me about divorce now more than they ever talk to me about their marriage. And I wonder to them out loud, if that person broke their marriage vow to you, what makes you think that they wouldn't break their divorce vows too. What makes you think that if, if someone broke their marriage vows to you that they would all of a sudden say, but this divorce is a covenant and I'm gonna keep that one. Once vows are broken, they're broken. And divorce is a death. Why don't we tell people that more often? Divorce is the death of something. It's the death of a covenant, it's the death of the vows, of promises made and unkept. It is the dissolution of something that no longer is. That is death. The grieving process that we go through, even in amicable divorces, is the same grieving process that we go when somebody near us dies. It's unavoidable. It's human psychology. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross told us 50 years ago, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, the phases of grief. The same things are true about divorce. Yet somehow people think that their experience of this kind of death will be different because they watch The Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce on Netflix. 
And we haven't even talked about how divorce affects children. Jesus ends his debate with the Pharisees and Mark immediately talks to us about children. That's not a coincidence. Most of our discussions about divorce center around the two people getting divorced and they hardly take into account the children unless the children become bargaining chips. If we grieve during this kind of death, we need to remember that our children grieve as well and that what we do affects the way that they view marriage. Jesus is trying to tell us that divorce is more difficult than we think it is. And I'm sure that when he saw in his own time divorces for any cause, he saw the same kind of devastation that we see when people get divorced today. Jesus says that the two shall become one flesh. And that's a quote from Genesis 2. But then he also adds an interpretation of that passage. He says the two have become one flesh. What God has put together, let no one separate. That's an addition. That's an interpretation that Jesus is making of Genesis 2. Because in Genesis, when you read the two become one flesh, that could simply be talking about the fact that when two people get together in marriage, they create a being that is both of their flesh, a child. Jesus is saying that binding yourself in marriage, however, is the equivalent of being grafted to one another. If you want to break that, it's going to be like ripping your skin off. And anybody who has experienced divorce knows that that's true. It's gonna hurt. Divorce is death. Now, it may feel like I've been hammering on this, but I want you to know that as tough as divorce is, and as much as we wanna affirm marriage and contest the idea that divorce is somehow easy or advisable, as our culture would have you believe, I also wanna tell you that sometimes divorce is necessary, which is my third point. Jesus tells us that it is because of our hardness of heart that Moses gave laws about divorce. In other words, divorce is supposed to be an exception to the rule and a dispensation for a pastoral necessity. For as many divorces as I have seen that seemed frivolous or ill-advised or avoidable, I have also seen divorces that were necessary. Sometimes flesh indeed needs to be torn apart for the survival of one person. When we get married, we say the famous words until we are parted by death or till death do us part. And sometimes a marriage dies before either of the people involved in the marriage die. Abuse, neglect, infidelity, addiction, lies either to oneself or one's partner. My own parents were divorced when I was in college because my dad's alcoholism and addiction to pornography got so bad that it was killing my mom's soul. And my dad was dragging her down to the hell that he was living in. Marriages do die and sometimes divorce is just the funeral. Jesus knows this. Jesus knows this. We're not here to say, as some theologians have said, that Jesus does not believe in the necessity of divorce. Jesus knew ultimately what people were and what people are. The letter to the Hebrews is one of the clearest statements in our tradition that tells us the depth of Jesus's understanding of humanity. Jesus came down to earth in order to know our sufferings and to die deaths like the ones that we die. It was fitting, Hebrews says, that God for whom and through whom all things exist in bringing many children to glory should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Our ultimate claim about Jesus is that the son of the living God, who is God incarnate, came to be among us so that God could experience our suffering in the flesh. And that in the flesh, he could redeem our suffering through his death, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus knows what it's like to grieve the death of a friend. He lost Lazarus. Jesus obviously knows what it's like to grieve a culture that considers divorce for any cause, a perfectly justifiable feature of society or religious practice. Jesus knows that divorce is a death, 
that it is not easy and it's not as easy as we think it is, but that it is sometimes necessary. And he is saying to us, don't enter into death unadvisedly or lightly. If divorce is death, do not enter into death unadvisedly or lightly in the same way that we don't enter into marriage unadvisedly or lightly. The problems that we think we can escape through divorce follow us. Because just like most of our problems in our lives, we eventually find out that any issues on our own end do not disappear no matter how far we run away. If there is one thing that I could leave you with today, especially for those who are married, but even for those who are friends of married people, it's this. We need support at all times of our lives, in all situations. Don't let embarrassment be the reason that you allow your marriage to die. Jesus promises that those who seek will find. So seek. Don't put all of your problems on friends. Sometimes professional help is necessary for the deeper issues that can happen in a marriage. But take your things to your friends. They might have a perspective that will help you. Also recognize that there are people who promise to support you in your marriage. Don't seek to self-justify, but be honest about the times where you, you have fallen short and times your partner has fallen short, but always focus on yourself. Remember the things that made you fall in love with one another. Give each other the benefit of the doubt, no matter how well you know the other person. Giving each other grace can go a long way in resolving resentment. Recognize that you didn't marry a perfect person, that there's no such thing as a perfect marriage, and that just trying to live a good life is hard enough without adding unrealistic expectations. Hold yourself accountable for the promises that you made to your spouse. Don't take the easy way out. Don't play the blame game, play the solutions game. Marriage is a team effort and just like any team, there will be times when one person is performing at the top of their game and the other person is being carried. That happens. If you're the person carrying most of the weight, have grace for your partner in their struggles. If you are the person being carried, recognize that your partner cannot sustain that situation indefinitely. Play like a champion. Get up when you're knocked down. If not for yourself, for your partner and for the vows that you made before God, and most of all, know that you can face many challenges, get over many disappointments, and know that it's not always easy, it's always worth it. Your church is here to support you and to remind you that your Redeemer loves you and wants you to thrive as a person. Because marriage is ultimately about thriving. It's about thriving as a person, thriving as a family, and learning about how much God loves us. Is it difficult? Yes. Has God had difficulty being married to the church and the people of faith throughout history? You bet ya. God knows what it's like to be in a difficult marriage. But God also knows that it's worth it. That God sent Jesus to live and die for us in order to show us the way to everlasting life is proof that God values us. God wants for us to overcome the power of death, all the various kinds of death that can happen in life. We don't have to deny the necessity of divorce sometimes. Jesus didn't. But it may help our marriages to recognize that it is a type of death and that just like marriage, death should not be entered into unadvisedly or lightly. Amen. <laughs>
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. The prayers of the people, form two, is found on page three in your bulletins. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world our bishop, especially Wayne and Nettie, for this gathering of all ministers, especially Christopher and Ann, and the people of St. Andrews, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him, especially the seminaries. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially those who died this past week. Pray for those who have died. For Betty Wells and for the son-in-law of Dorothy Jones. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been in honor, especially St. Andrews and all the saints. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to be your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you.
Good morning. Let's be done talking about the work. <laughs> um, just a just a couple of announcements this morning. We have the um, uh, folks from Xavier and Bellarmine Chapel coming next Saturday, October 9th, to help us clean up all our kind of outside garden areas. If anybody is available to help, I, is it nine to noon? Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. So nine to noon next Saturday, if you want to help beautify the outside of St. Andrews and work with some Xavier students, um, we'd love to have some representation from St. Andrews helping with our, uh, our own gardens. Um, I was told this morning, and thanks, uh, thank you to uh, Mary Williams, uh, Dorothy, Mrs. Dorothy Jones, who was an 8 a.m. parishioner, her son-in-law uh, died this week. And so uh, we'd ask that you keep her daughter, Chrissy, and their family in your prayers this week. Um, please also keep the, fam the uh, Wilson and Wells family in your prayers this week. I went, um, I went last Sunday after church to visit uh, Vic's. Um, mother in the hospital, Betty Wells, she had had a stroke and they thought she was going to get better and she passed away yesterday morning. So she was 98 years old. She had a, a wonderful life and Vic and the family are all grateful for our prayers and our presence with them um, and for her life. So um, keep them in your prayers also. Are there any other announcements that, that we have? Yeah, Rick. Pray for Leroy. Okay, so uh, Leroy's brother, Leroy, what's your brother's name? Dwight. Dwight. So please pray for the Staples family and for Dwight Staples. Um, Dwight entered in the hospital yesterday. Uh, is he in town? Okay, well, give me his information. I'll go visit him and say some prayers. Are there any um, birthdays or inverse? Oh, Katrina? Oh, Diane is here with us again. Or Deborah, sorry. Uh, sorry, Deborah. Yes. So Deborah is visiting us this morning from St. Simon. So, so Deborah is saying that she, she uh, 40, 49 years ago, 47 years ago, for all the people on Zoom, uh, 47 years ago, she attended St. Andrews, the college student. Uh, these days, she attends St. Simon's of Cyrene over in Lincoln Heights. And we're, we're grateful to have you here with us this morning. Are there any birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate this morning? All right. <laughs> God, our time is coming with this day that we pray on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Happy birthdays. Thank you. I told them I only ask kids what age they are. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever.
These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, 
You have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. And may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.